Hello and welcome to my channel. I do a number of different topics and a lot of them on PowerShell. The other stuff that I tend to work on the most is data centric topics like Databricks and Spark and things like that. This topic is one I find a lot of fun to be honest. It's, it's a great diversion for me to actually work on this for a while which is developing user interfaces with PowerShell. Now I've done two other videos on this and I did misnumber them so you may be a little confused. You'll see a part three out there which is um, one way to do UIs with PowerShell that's a little less advanced. I think that one was on Posh GUI, which I'll talk a little about. But this I considered and originally intended, I left a gap here, so I'm backtracking, a little like the Star Wars movies. I'm backtracking and this is part two, but it's really meant to be the culmination because it's the most extensive solution to building a UI with PowerShell, at least in my opinion. I call it the luxury solution because while it gives you a lot of stuff, it is not free. You got, you're going to have to invest a little bit here. And you can see this luxury car, a Rolls Royce. I don't have, I think that's a Rolls Royce or Bentley. That is not the car I drive. Wouldn't mind having one. Wouldn't mind having a chauffeur to go with it. Pretty cool, but uh, don't have that. But that's kind of the image I want to convey. My name's Brian Kafferke. I'm a data, data and AI solutions enabler, aka consultant. And uh, on the right, I want to full disclosure to remind myself that I, I need to tell you I have no involvement with Sapien Technologies. They don't know I'm even recording this. <laughs> I hope they like it, I guess. <laughs> uh, but uh, I do know some people I've had contact from there. A lot of the top PowerShell people work for Sapien Technologies, and they are the ones that sell PowerShell Studio among some other products. I think this is their flagship product. I'm going to talk about it. I purchased it outright when I was writing my PowerShell book plug here pro PowerShell for database developers but it's a good book for anyone so go get it it's riveting anyway uh, when I was writing that book I just wanted to explore what ways you could use uh, PowerShell to develop a user interface and I purchased it it's uh, it, it was a few dollars but I just wanted to have it it just looks too cool to ignore so where are we gonna go in this discussion we're gonna talk about the three frameworks that Windows has evolved over time for writing Windows user interfaces, which is WinForms, WPF, and UWP. The other thing, I've had to face my demons. I've had to search myself for answering one of life's deep questions. Should I move from PowerShell 5.1 to 6 and 7? In other words, going from po Windows PowerShell to PowerShell Core. And uh, it's a soul-searching question, and we will look at that. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what GUI's, <laughs> Windows GUI development involves very quickly on that. And then I'm going to talk about options for developing solutions with a GUI in PowerShell. And then finally, which is going to be most of this, is going to be a demonstration walking through using PowerShell Studio to build a simple GUI. And we'll take a look at that. If people are interested, I can do more on this and build more complex GUIs uh, and do other things. But let's jump in. So in the beginning was WinForms, or WinForm I have here, it should probably be plural, WinForms. And WinForms is really, when I think of that, I think of Visual Basic. It's the sort of original way of doing Windows. And what it comes down to is in the Windows system, there is a library, and now it's part of .NET, where you can say, I need a window. And internally, Windows will say, create a window, and it has a function it calls, and boom, a window pops up. And there's properties and parameters and all those things to those functions. Those functions are exposed, and when you write a WinForm application, you're actually writing code that is calling these functions that build, these objects and functions that build the Windows user interface. There's a lot of stuff in there, and so you're leveraging the libraries in Windows, and WinForms do that. Now, a key takeaway is there's actual code doing everything, building a form, building a button, setting properties, code for everything. Uh, Microsoft came up with something called WPF. They thought, hey, you know, that goes way back. So they came up with something about 10 years ago called, I think it was about 10 years ago, WPF. And WPF is meant to be, the biggest difference is, aside from a few pieces of functionality, they wanted to kind of separate the presentation layer from the code. And so they took all of the presentation things, the windows, the buttons, et cetera, the controls, and they persist those as a sort of version of XML. They call XAML, X-A-M-L. And so that's, to me, the biggest difference. Other than that, it's not, from a development standpoint, it really wouldn't be too different unless you want to manipulate those YAML files directly. And then Microsoft had this great idea. Now, you have to 
go into the Wayback Machine. This was when Microsoft thought if we run on all our Windows machines, then we're universally supporting everything, right? Because it's only a Windows world. So this is before Microsoft became a cloud platform and wants to support everything. And so the idea of a universal Windows platform, w UWP, really meant that you could run on any Windows type of platform. So you could run on a PC at the time there, Windows Phone, uh, HoloLens, etc. So that was the idea behind UWP. Now that's pretty much gone away. I think that Microsoft is now thinking in terms of universal means cross-platform. We'll talk about that also. So UWP isn't something you'd really write anymore. And WPF is something people use, but it's not necessary in a way. But you, if you use WPF, you will get a slicker looking interface. You'll have more features. But um, generally with PowerShell, WinForm is the way to go. It's just easier to work with. It works better with PowerShell because PowerShell integrates nicely with the .NET libraries. Now, if you want, I had this link here to remind me to show you. There's a nice link here, but you can just Google this, search it, Bing it, whatever you want, and you will get brought to this blog, which basically talks about that, you know, UWT is not the future anymore of Windows apps. And that was a year ago, 2019, talking about all this stuff in here. So take a look, but I, I found something similar that Microsoft had also said. So UWP is kind of out, and WPF is also legacy. WinForms goes way back. It is not going away. Microsoft has made no statement saying it's going to go away. I think it's uh, WinForms is just here with us for the duration. Now I need to talk about the not-so-subtle PowerShell revolution. Uh, about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I went to a the Windows, excuse me, the Boston PowerShell user group meeting and I lucked out I actually went there because Jeffrey Snover was coming he's the sort of father at Microsoft to PowerShell and he was doing a presentation and it was on PowerShell 6 aka PowerShell Core and I really didn't know anything about it I kept seeing PowerShell Core and I was ignoring it because I didn't see how it affected me and I'll talk about that in a minute but when you're dealing with PowerShell 5.1 and lower you're dealing with a Windows only. It was built for Windows, It's and it integrates tightly with Windows. And that's all it was meant to do. You have to kind of get into the mindset of how PowerShell evolved. When PowerShell came out, all you had to work with to script in the Windows environment was DOS, the old DOS commands. But that was never designed to work with Windows objects and all these frameworks and all the services we have. So Microsoft came up with PowerShell to be the Windows scripting language. In fact, it was originally called Windows Scripting Host. That's how specific it was. So PowerShell was meant to do that, and it did a great job. So now you could actually do all kinds of stuff in PowerShell that manipulated anything in Windows. It was really great. That version, 5.1, is now what is still delivered on any machine you buy. So you go get a Windows box, machine, whatever. It's going to come with PowerShell 5.1. Nothing newer. So Microsoft is not trying to force anyone to move, at least not this time. Now, one of the things also is PowerShell, this version 5.1 and before, had its own built-in integrated script editor called the PowerShell ISC. I actually really like the PowerShell ISC. I'm having a hard time letting go of it. I don't know if I will let go of it. And it is not supported by the later versions. The PowerShell ISC is sort of the built-in uh, PowerShell Studio, if you will, PowerShell, almost a Visual Studio for PowerShell that you get out of the box in Windows. It's, it's not as fully featured, it's not very GUI-like, but it has a lot of nice windows to be, you have a console, you have all this stuff, so it, it works well. And in particular, what I like also is there's a lot of great modules, a huge number of modules that were written for this these versions of Windows, of PowerShell. And one of them in particular is the Azure Automation Script Authoring Tool, which I do a presentation on doing Azure Automation with PowerShell. And it's a great tool. It allows you to sync up your Azure Automation account resources with your client and do development on your client and then push things into Azure really easily. So I like it. It is not supported after 5.1. At least I can't find a way to make it run. Maybe I will. So that's another reason for sort of sticking here. Also, I recently did some Azure automation and generally it's still easier to use the earlier versions like Azure RM, uh, versions of modules, and that's what you still get. AZ, I couldn't find readily available to do things. So there's, it's still easier, actually. The sort of default path of least resistance is still using PowerShell 5.1 and earlier. So having said all that, that's the sort of state of where things were. And then 
in the background, Microsoft was trying to do something made PowerShell cross-platform. That's when something evolved called PowerShell Core, which was eventually named PowerShell 6 and released as a uh, PowerShell. And here's a problem, which is it's a very confusing numbering. I personally disagree with calling it 6.0 because it's misleading. When you see SQL Server, you know, now they do it by years, but when you saw six, SQL Server 6 and then SQL Server 7 and things, you're thinking, wow, a lot of new features. This is adding on to what we've had. That's not what's happening with PowerShell 6. So PowerShell 6 really is a fork in the PowerShell development. It's a fork in which before that, everything was just built on Windows and you had great Windows support. PowerShell 6 is PowerShell Core and it's a different branch. It removed a lot of functionality. It removed a lot of things, including WPF and WinForms, which we need to use in PowerShell for doing GUI development. It removed all of that. And in return, what it was trying to do is it allows you to run PowerShell on Linux and Mac, on Mac OS, which is great for that platform support and certainly aligns with Microsoft's goal of being a cloud and not being, being cloud uh, agnostic to the operating system. And uh, in doing that, so now you get Mac, you know, and Linux support, however, you lost a lot. You also can't run in the ISE anymore. So if you've noticed that PowerShell now it's all about using VS Code and PowerShell and they've got extensions, that's because the ISE isn't supported after 5.1. They've also had to rewrite PowerShell modules so that they will work in the new version. So this is a very big branch. It reminds me an awful lot of the Python 2.7 and earlier split and then Python 3 and all the right coders have said, I have to rewrite everything. It's very similar to that, at least when you got to the 6.0 place when this first happened a couple of years ago. It's And again, it's misleading because they're very different branches and PowerShell 5.1 and lower are still supported. 5.1 is the current Windows PowerShell version it's still supported, it's there, and there's no one saying it's going away, although definitely the long-term direction is Microsoft, I think, wants to get to one code base and get rid of having the path, uh, having two. Okay, seven, and I'll call this a state of union, PowerShell seven, which is this continuation of the PowerShell core, I'll call this a state of union because it just got released in GA a month ago. There's a video on YouTube with the product manager, Joey Aiello, I think I had said the last name right, um, talks about it and it announces things. There's some new features. Most of what it's doing though, I think, is playing catch up on 5.1, trying to get that backward compatibility. There was a huge lashback on Microsoft by the PowerShell community for being left in the lurch with a lot of lost functionality. And really it just didn't make it feasible for many, especially large shops that were had a lot of PowerShell code to go to core. This was meant to bridge that gap. So unlike the Python division where a Python community just said, the Python world just said, tough luck, you got to go to three and we're not even giving you any backward compatibility. Microsoft saw the problem. It is a commercial product. It's open source, but it's also a core product of Microsoft, something that ties their systems together. And so they backed in and gave, giving a lot of that backward compatibility. So it's much better now. If you were to go to seven, you would have a much easier job than if you were trying to move from 5.1 to 6. So it's moving along. But I, I think there's still, it's fair to say, there's a feature parity gap. And there's still things that you can do in the Windows area that you can't quite do. And it's also not completely seamless. They're trying to make it completely like you just can lift and shift, in this case, in PowerShell versions. But I don't think it's quite there yet. But it is getting there. The takeaway is this story is still unfolding. If you've seen it, some people, especially probably people on Microsoft side, it's that, but a lot of people on Microsoft would say, just jump into seven, that's the way to go, it's all slick. I would say, keep watching like anything, see where it goes. Microsoft is always watching and always modifying their strategy and what they're doing according to what makes sense. And they're definitely listening to customers. I think it's safe, this is again, personal opinion, I think it's safe to stay on PowerShell 5.1 for the foreseeable future. But do keep an eye on this because, one for one thing, the new features are being added into seven and later, and you're gonna you may want some of those. If you need this, if you run a lot of Linux environments and Macs, and you want to be able to have that cross-platform, by all means, go to seven. Especially if you don't have any legacy to worry about, then I would say anybody who is going to just jumping into PowerShell for the first time, I would try to go with seven. 
Another feature about 7 is you can run it side by side with 5, which is nice. But again, the story is unfolding. If you only need Windows PowerShell, then there's really not a lot to tell you to go to 7. In my case, I'm still fighting using VS Code to do PowerShell development. I use PowerShell Studio, that's true, but I also use the ISE quite a bit, and I like the ISE, so I kind of hate to move off it. <laughs> so I'm a bit curmudging that way, so let me move forward. But it's come a long way, and I'm impressed with what they've done in 7. I feel like in 7, they really listen to the customers. They've made a lot of adjustments, and I think that's um, looking good going forward. So kind of to show you visually, because this is how I see it in my head, what's really happening in the PowerShell 567 situation is in the beginning, we had Windows PowerShell, which did all these great things specifically for Windows. And, you know, and then Microsoft said, let there be a split. And the split happened that Windows 5.1 was sort of locked down. That's the last version of the Windows PowerShell. And then a split happened in which you had cross-platform support. PowerShell Core, now PowerShell 6.0, uh, Later to call that was meant to be cross-platform. It runs on Linux and Mac OS and Windows. That's the idea of it. But of course you have to get commonality to do that so you lost a lot of functionality. Then they added 7 and 7 added a lot of backward compatibility to answer customers questions. Now this fork is really important because I see this as really probably a code-based fork as well. It's a fork and it's misleading because the 6.0 is a different path. It's not a continuation of what was happening on the left side. So again, I wish Microsoft had just renamed it, but I think they wanted to, I'm not sure the right way where it is, uh, make it seem less of a major shift than it is. Uh, then PowerShell, I think this will happen for a while. It might be PowerShell 7 point, 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 maybe a PowerShell 8. I don't know, but I think that's going to continue to happen. And then eventually there'll be a merge. There'll be a point where it's just like we got PowerShell. And once, if, if Microsoft could say you can run anything you had before, in PowerShell, we'll say version 8 or 9 or something, and no changes, then there's really no reason why anybody cares, and people will move to it. But that relies a lot on 100% compatibility and feature parity, which is a really tough thing to go. I, I empathize greatly with the PowerShell team trying to do that. Not an easy thing to do that. You're talking about very different platforms. Uh, but I think that's the path, and uh, yeah, that's it. So take a look at it. If you're doing PowerShell's development, again, if you're new, it's kind of like Python. I would always say when people are starting Python, once it, you knew 3 was there, just go with 3. Why start going backwards? So if you're going to be doing this, go with uh, PowerShell 7 and try it out and use it. You may have to go to 5 point something for different reasons. I, again, ran into some issues with PowerShell automation. Maybe they're gone. I don't know. But things are still settling down, I think, working out. It's an evolving story. All right, let me move on now. In our case, I will be using... Windows PowerShell 5.1 because we're doing informed development and because I have not tested Windows 7 yet and it is new. So Windows GUI development. In the beginning, now in, uh, in Windows development you have a series of visual containers. They're in code, they're actually classes and objects that inherit things and blah blah blah. So you actually have an object called a window, but it's also visual, right? You can see the window on the screen. So you create, the first thing you typically create in a Windows application is a window. Not a surprise. Then you might say, I'm going to add a label, and that label might be, you know, enter your first name. Then a text box where you enter your first name. Then you might have a drop down list of uh, what department you work in. Then you add some buttons to add, change, delete, or whatever you're going to do. So, a button's here. Now, these objects, the labels, the text box, drop down list, are all children objects of the window. Okay. And very often in Windows, you might hear, like in Python, they tend to call this, like in Kivi, they call it widgets, but it's the same idea. And there's a hierarchy. So this is a, a pattern which is repetitive. Almost in any of the graphical environments I've worked in with different tools, they tend to fall into this same structure. It's just the way things are done in a GUI interface. And then you have some, maybe another container this time, a group box. And in that group box, you create a label and a text box. Now what you're getting is sort of a tree of objects, a hierarchy. The window owns everything. The label, excuse me, the drop-down list, the buttons, those are children of the window, and the group box is a child of the window. The label and text box within the group box are actually children of the group box, and therefore, uh, which is a child of the window. A little visual for that in a minute, but I wanted to talk about that. So you got this window going along, and it's great. 
when you're looking at a user interface, a GUI user interface, it's all about waiting for the user to do something, right? I mean, the window just sits there until you click, until you drag, until you do something. Those are called events. So there's what's called an event loop. Now, you don't see this anymore, but in the old days, you actually had to write a loop to do this. But it's essentially an infinite loop. It just keeps waiting. Okay, did anyone do anything? It's polling. Anyone, anything, click, typing, whatever. The event loop is polling to see are you doing anything. And when an event happens, like a click, there's code linked to that event and that object to run. So you would have code tied to, for instance, a button click event, and then that code would run when you click the button. And those can also pass parameters to your uh, event sometimes, or you can interact with the code to the objects. As I mentioned, this hierarchy window, then your labels, then you just get the group box, and that kind of thing. Now, I will also point out something else as I, I do this. You have this hierarchy. The other thing I like to do, and it's a fairly standard practice in Windows development, is when you create your object, we'll see that you can set properties for your objects, like labels and text boxes. I always use a three character prefix, I try to, and then the name of the object. It's, I don't know what new standards, C sharp programmers may have changed things, but uh, I like three characters so consistently because it's easy to say, what is it? When you're running your code, you have your window screen here. When you're in your code, you can't see the form. Usually you're kind of like, okay, so you kind of bop between the two. What did I call that button? You go back to the UI designer and you say, oh, okay, I called that TXT, whatever. So if you name things consistently in your code and name the properties in the visual designer, in this case, you might say LBL is a label, TXT is a text box, DDL is a drop-down list, uh, BTN is a button. By doing that, it's easier in your code to figure out, number one, what events are linked to code, and also refer to things like, I need to get to the save button, and I want to get the, I want to click it or something, which you can do in code, or, or get the value in a text, the text name, well, I could just refer to it as txt name dot text, and I will get the value in there. But if it's if I use the defaults like text blob number one twenty two and all that that they normally name it, I'm not going to be able to make any sense in the code. That's my background. That's my training on Windows GUI development. So let's talk. I want to talk about PowerShell user interfaces. When you write a PowerShell uh, GUI using WinForms most of these things, there's always this concept of your presentation layer and then the code that acts on the events. Okay, So on the left hand, I'll say script one. It would be my, my script that holds the code that defines the Windows presentation objects. The form, so the windows, the buttons, the text boxes, that's what that does. It doesn't have to be in a separate script, but it often is. And if you look at some of the goals of Microsoft's WPF and especially the idea was to separate those so that the definition of those objects is separate from the event code and the reason is fairly straightforward the presentation layer is is, is a screen it's a, it's a set of objects they've got properties it's a little bit more static and it's 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 a definition not dynamic code as a rule it's not meant to do anything other than create your visual interface the other side is what acts when you do things on that interface Typically, the right side, once the UI is built on the left, there's a lot less happening to that. The code on the right, that's what's really you're going to be maintaining, changing how it works, changing other things. When I, when I use, if I would, when I write, let me say, I used to use a product that Sapien uh, Technologies had, which was the Community Edition, that allowed you to build forms. I can't remember, I think primary script or something, but allow you to build forms, and it would just build the left script for you, and then I would write a second, second script that did the uh, event code. And it worked out really well because I would just keep the second script, the first script on the left, and I could make changes and everything else and just keep regenerating it and changing it. And I didn't have to touch the event code. And I could just have one script that sort of linked the two together, say run script one, run script two, both were in memory, and I could keep them separate. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm just talking about here. And you'll see that it's not as explicit in what we do later, but I'll show you how it works. Even in PowerShell Studio, there's still a bit of this separation. Okay, and you can see here, btn click underscore save. That's important to point out that there is a standard uh, GUI naming convention Windows typically uses, which is to have the object, the visual object name like btn, that could be a button name, right? And then an underscore, and then the event name that, it's, that the code is related to. So this event, if you click on the button, button save, click, 
this is the code that will happen. You could have button save, mouse down, and that means if you mouse down on something, this is the code that happens. You could have txt name uh, underscore type or whatever it is, uh, key down, and that event means if you key down in that text box, an event happens as code runs. The point is that standard naming convention is really good, and I try to stick to it because it makes it a lot easier to read the code. Again, you can't see the visual interface when you're reading the code. So if I see btn save underscore click, I know, okay, there's probably, there's a button there that's a, ba a save button and the event they want to do when you click on it is this code. I could link the event, you know, to here's my save button. I'm going to link it to Jehoshaphat's and that's going to be my code, Jehoshaphat's my function, but who's going to be able to understand what that function was intended to do when they read my code? They're not going to be able to very easily. They, they have to go back to the, the visual editor, the designer, which linked it. And you'll see in the code, there's a way to, to set up that they call it hooking it up or whatever wiring your events you can wire it differently but by using the defaults it really makes things a lot easier now PowerShell Studio is going to write what's on the left side but we have to write what's on the right that's the event code what do you want to do now before I jump into PowerShell Studio as I mentioned I see this as sort of the end game if you're willing to spend a little money and make your life easier and get a really cool environment to write your scripts then PowerShell Studio, great. But if you're, you're saying, I don't know that I want to spend the money, maybe you're just trying to learn, maybe you just need a quick and dirty interface, your first option is just use basic PowerShell. I did a video on this, the first one in this series. Show command is really good. It was something that was not supported in 6. Show command is supposed to be supported in 7. What show command does is if you write a advanced function, watch my video on that, properly written, the show command will actually create an automatic visual interface around that function, including taking your drop, your validate your know, valid values and putting that in a drop down list for you and editing and it will even uh, kick back values you can have invalid parameter values that can kick back so it, it actually reads the function and automatically builds a UI for it so that's really powerful because if your goal is simply to share functions with other people you may not have to write any GUI look at the show command the other thing that's really powerful is outgrid view another thing which was added support for in seven that had been lost and oh my god i use that all the time so would not be good for me to lose that uh, i'll use it today in fact but outgrid view is really powerful because not only does it allow us to pipe data into a grid but this grid is sort uh, searchable it's sortable it supports almost anything you can throw into it it allows us to select objects it lets you process you know select items in it and do things it's really, you could build a pretty slick interface just using our grid view and a few other PowerShell features. So that if your basic needs can be met with using PowerShell, do that. You can also write WinForm code from scratch. You can use WinForms and just write that whole definition. We'll see it. It's not impossible, a bit tedious, but hey, if that's what you want to do, go for it. If you're a little lazier like I am, uh, and a quick and dirty way to do this for free, go to poshgui.com. It's a nice UI. I have a video on it. Go take a look. I'll put these videos at the end so you can find them. But uh, poshgui.com, you go there, and it has a visual interface, a designer, in which you can build your Windows UI. Uh, in my video, I talk about it. be very careful to keep saving a lot because if you click away from it being a stateless environment, you'll lose your code and you'll have to start all over again. But it's a really cool way. It's not as advanced as PowerShell Studio in terms of what you can create, but it's a good way if you just need some basic stuff and fairly cool stuff. Uh, po PowerShell Pro Tools Suite for VS Visual Studio VS Code. This is something I have not looked at closely yet, so I need to take a look at it. I need to evaluate it. It's cheaper. It is a pay for tool. Uh, it's 99.99. I hate these psychological pricings, but not, basically it's 100 bucks if you want to buy Pro Tools Suite. Now I looked at this just a few months ago and it was just Pro Pro Tools and it was only $59.99, so 60 bucks. So big price increase when they added the word suite. I don't really know what went in there, so I don't want to be critical. I'm gonna take a look at it. I'm gonna to have to cough up $99, I guess, or hundred dollars and buy it. So if people are interested, let me know. Put comments in if you're interested, and I'll have to take a look at that as well and see. PowerShell Pro Tools Suite though is designed to work with VS Code and Visual Studio. So if you're using a PowerShell ISC or something, it's not an option for that. It's it's a pretty good thing to consider if you're looking at PowerShell, probably seven eventually. I don't know how well it will work with PowerShell seven, although via it also uses WinForms and I believe it supports WPF. But again, that won't work with six. It may work with seven for you. While while PowerShell seven says they support these things and I believe them, 
there's usually you got to make sure things don't have any quirks so I'd say to check that and uh, let Microsoft know through GitHub if there's a problem. Finally, we're going to talk about using a complete solution right now, PowerShell Studio by Sapien Technologies. Now, I've mentioned it's a great tool. I really like it. It was a little pricey. I had to bite the bullet and buy it, so I don't like buying. I don't like, I'm cheap. I don't like buy, buying anything. But anyway, here's a little picture. PowerShell Studio, one thing that's interesting about them is they name it a little like SQL Server. Every year, they seem to release a new version, so PowerShell Studio 2020 right now. You have to pay for the initial purchase of PowerShell Studio, and you own it. And I believe you get maintenance typically, at least when I bought it, was a year that you can update. If you want to keep getting all the updates and going from like, you know, 2017 to all the way now 2020, then you have to pay for a maintenance uh, renewal, which is, I think, about half the price of the original purchase. And then sometimes they have discounts. So wait for Labor Day and Fourth of July and events like that, because they usually have discounts, and that's usually when I've been renewing. Uh, but they're very good about keeping it up to date and they have a lot of blogs and things published to answer questions and things so that's it PowerShell Studio I do want to emphasize I'm focusing a lot on building UI I should point out though PowerShell Studio is meant to be a serious professional automation PowerShell developer type environment it's meant to be something you know you have Visual Studio for C-sharp developers this is meant to be the same kind of thing for a PowerShell developer, giving you all the tools. You can compile to EXEs with it, you can encrypt things, you can set, there's all kinds of tools in it. There's a performance testing, you can integrate testing with it. Uh, so there's a lot of different pieces here. So enough said there. And before I jump in, I will jump into my demo. I kind of want to, while you can see this big screen, get a feel for what you get with PowerShell Studio and how it works. If, if you're going to do any kind of Windows designer, this is very, very similar looking to Visual Basic and even Visual Studio when you build this form. In the center of the screen, you can see that this is a form that's being designed, one I built, and it's a shopping list application. So I've got this window coming up where you enter the name, description, etc. You have a button at the bottom, add, update, etc. And you notice that there's a designer and a script. What we're looking now is the designer tab. So this is a picture of the form. If we click on the script, we'll see that there's the code that runs when we click and do things on that. On the left side, we have a toolbox, and the toolbox has all these things we can drag onto the form. So we can we can put a button on it, we can put a chart on a checkbox. Now, one of the things I really like about PowerShell Studio that I didn't see in Pro Power Tools Designer is you can drag controls over and drop them, which is very intuitive, and I find a lot easier to use. I, I didn't understand what it was doing when I just played with it, and then I had to look it up and say, oh, you click on the thing and then and then click on the form but PowerShell Studio can just drag controls over set properties etc on the tabs next to it you can configure this how you want but I have the toolbox pop up but I can click on project and that will keep basically a inventory of the files that go with my project I'm working on and the optic browser allows me to explore PowerShell modules and things like that on the right side you get all the properties so whatever you click on and select in the visual designer the properties window will set context to that. So you can see here, it's clicked on something called DGY shoppers list, and that's the properties. But if I clicked on just the form or a text box, then I can set the properties. And you can see there's a lot of properties that go with that. So I'll talk more about that. Um, so we drag and drop controls. We can set properties here. And if you switch the tab, let me go back. Notice it's clicked on the uh, designer is highlighted in blue on the tab in the in, just off to the window. And if I go here, now the script's highlighted and you can see that it's got the code that we relate. Now, dollar sign form shopping list, that's the name of my form. Dollar sign's key because PowerShell is, is storing script blocks. What, the, what are script blocks? In this case, they are variables of PowerShell that hold scripts. They hold a code <laughs> for lack of purpose. So dollar sign form shopping list is the name of the, my form. Underscore underscore separates that from the event name, which is load. So when the form loads, that's the event, then equals, and then it's defining the code to run. So this is wiring the code to the event, and it's using the default naming, which is the object name underscore event name. And notice it says equal. When you put equal and then the uh, braces here, the, yeah, braces, I think, <laughs> uh, what's in between those is code PowerShell code so that's how it's linking things together so I don't have anything in the list the load event I don't have anything in the label click but you can see below BTN add update that's my name of my button 
underscore click. If you click on add update, it's starting to assign internal names. Dollar sign name is equal to txt. That's the name of the text box dot property, which is txt. So I'll go over some more of that in the demo, but you can see from the screen what's happening here. What's really good about it is just the, the integration of everything. It makes it really easy to develop your code. So without further ado, I'm going to jump in and demo using PowerShell Studio. So let me go over here. Now I, I always put everything in my taskbar and I'm forcing myself to go to the menu here. Uh, if I go to my menu, I can drag down here and I'm going to go to Sapien. And I really wish they just put it under PowerShell Studio so I don't have to think of the company name. Uh, but here it is, Technologies. And I can go, I'm only on 2019. They're on 2020, so I may have to update that. Uh, and you notice I also have Help Writer. I haven't updated that in a while, but there's a, another system they have that you can build help systems with PowerShell and a whole bunch of other things. I have like Document Explorer. When I go in there, sometimes I see all these tools. I'm like, yeah, I want to buy that, and I add these things in. Now, a surprising thing about PowerShell Studio, I have to give them credit, and it seems like it's gotten better over time. For all the stuff that's going on in PowerShell Studio, it really comes up fast. So you can see I'm already in here, and it's it's ready to go. So I'm, I'm impressed with that because I avoid Visual Studio. I use VS Code whenever I can to avoid Visual Studio because VS Code comes up a lot faster than Visual Studio, and I don't like waiting. Anyway, enough with my personal issues. Let's go in and create a new project. I'm going to say New. New power. Now you've got a bunch of options here, and I, this is also a great thing. You've got templates and things that can jumpstart your work. I'm going to say new project, so that way it will organize my files. New project, and um, I'm going to give it a name, and I'll just call it uh, demo. And here I'm going to say what kind of a project. So you can say it's a collection, things for grouping files, empty project, form project. If you pick the type of project, it will help guide you to getting the easiest way to configure it. So I'm going to call it a, now this is a, oh, let me, uh, yeah, a form project. There's a few ways to do this, but I can do a form project or I can do a multi-module, excuse me, multi-form project. Multi-form projects, if you know you want to do a bunch of forms, any more than one form really, just pick multi-form project because it automatically wires the uh, display, a main form and the display of a child form. And it allows you to easily add more child forms into your collection of forms so that maybe you have like a switchboard type of thing we have buttons here what do you want to do I want to check the movies and whatever I want to click here I want to look at my shopping list I want to click here and do things if you're going to pop up different forms go with the multi-form project but if you're just looking to create a simple form project go here and say create a form and I'm calling it demo and notice it will automatically much like VS Code or VS Visual Studio create a project folder it uh, you can integrate this with source code control like git so you can check off git ignore file etc let me create this and now it gives me a whole bunch of like starting points maybe maybe i want a dialog style so i can do a dialog style form and i think i will i will pick that uh, so i've got a dialog form but i can do you know and you see left it shows you a doc form i can create just an empty form so i'll create a i'm going to create an empty form what the heck this is what i've been doing in practice and believe it or not, I do practice before I do these so that I don't uh, take too long tripping over myself. All right, so here we are. I've created a project, and I've started it with a form. And you can see on the left side under the project folder, we have globals, main form, and startup. Now, globals is an interesting thing and a really useful thing. Any variables or code or functions that you want to share across your project, you can just put in globals.ps1, and you can share those. Your startup is where it, you're telling it function main, it takes, you can pass things, I haven't tried that. Uh, but basically this here is automatically going to start your form. So if you wanted to change, if you had multi forms, you could use this to change the first form that opens by changing this. This is a naming convention used by Sapien, not something built in. Uh, show and then the name of the form. And then PSF is the PowerShell form code. This is not, when it runs this, it's actually some sort of internal code Sapien's using. If you want to see all of the code, the code that's part of the Windows objects, you need to export the code, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. Okay, so you got all this stuff here. Uh, finally, we've got our main form, and notice that when I click here, I just get code, but when I click on a form, 
I have the script and I have the designer. So this is my visual designing environment. I can now create a nice form. I can drag it and notice on the right side you can see you know I can change the back color. So if I want to uh, I could change this to I don't know what would be nice maybe a little I want to uh, do that. It's kind of ugly. I'll go back to the color it is. I think that works out well. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so anyway, you can play with these properties. If I click on this li lightning bolt, this gives me all of the different things. If you So I could say I want a click event, a double click. I'll do a little of this. Uh, I can do all kinds of events and uh, just a lot of stuff you can play with the Thing here so when you want to wire events create event code to trigger this is what you use uh, and that's my project that's it okay so now I'm in here let's let's stop building an app one thing I will change though, I don't like that name form so let's change form notice it has it's got a form load event that was automatically created for me uh, I'm gonna go to my properties Where is form? Now it can be a little tricky to find the name of things. Let me see if I can find this. There it is. Uh, that's text. I want to change the, what's displayed there. I can just call this main. And notice in the upper left the name of the form changes. That's actually not the name though. That's the, the display text property which most controls have. Uh, da, 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 da. And now the name is here. Now I don't like to call it form name so I'm going to call it FRM. A nice thing is, at least in my practice here, uh, when you rename controls, PowerShell Studio renames anything else related to it. So if you had event code related, it automatically renames the event code and things as, as needed. So that's very handy. Now I'm going to go in here and I want to just say, okay, create a button. And go over here. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And I'm going to change the... Notice the properties now. You can see at the upper right here, if I can... I can't select that, but you can see button one is now selected. The name, I don't like that name, so I'm going to say BTN. And I'm going to say, I'm going to do something called get uh, file list. I'll call that, that's what I want to, that's the function, that's what it's going to do. I'm going to change the button face a little bit. I want to make it a little bit nicer looking. Uh, make it the info color so it's a little bit easier to see. Now, the if you change the caption, interesting, it renames the control to match your caption but if you change obviously the name it doesn't change the caption so that's good now, I want to change the text because that's useless right I'm going to say get I'll call it get child item because that's the command I'm going to use and that's all I have right now I can also add uh, I'll do that for now so I've got that now I don't have any events here there's two ways I can connect this to an event I can go here select the control notice I click away I get the form now I'm selecting the button and if I go here and go to the event the little lightning bolts my events then I can go on the click now I could type in a name of an event and hit enter and it will let me name it that way but I'd rather use the default naming so I can double click on the button so let me show you this because I like this actually or I can do it there but I'm gonna do it here because when you double click on a button it automatically assumes that you want to code for the click event and it automatically names it for you so I'm going to double click and here you can see it said get file list btn get file list click now really key again dollar sign tells me this is a PowerShell variable and it's going to be set equal to whatever code I write in here so I'm going to do when you click on this button I'm going to just and I can type in any standard PowerShell command so I'm going to get get child item I'm going to pipe this into out grid view and notice it has IntelliSense which is really nice and that's all I'm going to do I'm not going to be greedy here I just want to make sure I can get something to work that's always fun and you can see here right now I can just run this there's a lot of context sensitive things here so I can go in here and let's see what it does so I'll, lo and behold this is out grid view I can sort and things this is an automatic commandlet if you haven't used it it's probably my favorite favorite command in PowerShell, and I'm glad they added it to PowerShell 7. Uh, so you get Power, this get child item. I can close this now, 
and I will point out that you have all these debugger type things here so I can step in stop step over uh, a lot of features I haven't talked about just in general and this is signing scripts and analysis and performance there's a lot of stuff in here I'll show you how to compile this in a minute anyway that's my script go back to the form I see it here now I want to add a parameter to this so I'm gonna add uh, a label so that people know what I want to be typed in and again uh, the text here I'm going to change to is uh, I'll call it parameter very intuitive right and since it's a label caption I can put a colon at the end to kind of indicate what I want now the name is called label parameter notice it it automatically changed the name of the control to match my what I changed the text to all right uh, so I'm going to call this LBL. I don't like the full worded parameter. I'm just an LBL parameter. Great. So the name is LBL parameter. That's what I need to refer to in code to manipulate this. And the value in text is just what you see in the display. All right. Very important. And now I'm going to go in. Okay, that's great. Now, technically, some people might say, just ignore labels. You don't need to name them because you're probably not going to manipulate them. But I like to label everything clearly, give it names that make sense because I'm very detailed dish like that. Um, what I'm going to do now is get my text box, drop that here. And also notice that it helps you with alignment. So this tells me at the top, this tells me at the bottom where it is. Uh, it's pretty handy. And that little dash tells me it's properly spaced away from my label. There's a lot of grid alignment things to help you make it, you know, even people like me make a less sloppy interface. Uh, I'm going to make this parameter a little bit bigger. Her. That's good to go. Now what I want to do is whatever you type in here, I want to, and I want to change this obviously. So this would be T T X T parameter. Notice it's the same name as label, but TXT is the prefix. So that tells me this is where you actually type things. And I'm going to double click here. And when you, by doing that, I can get to the event code. I'll show you another way to do this in a second. Uh, but I want to do is I want to pass in as the perimeter to the path. Double click here. I can select that because I'm really lazy about typing. And what I want to do is put in the text box value. So I've got to, this is something I always forget. And I don't know why. But when you're doing this, you need to always start with the dollar sign because all of the objects are Python var PowerShell variables. So dollar sign. And then since I've named my prefixes, this comes in handy. All my text boxes start with TXT. So it automatically helps me with IntelliSense get to what I need. Now, another thing that's easy to forget is there are many different properties available on any given Windows control. If I hit the period, the IntelliSense kicks in and the properties and methods available are there. The value that's dis that people type in and it's displayed is called text. So if you want to refer to a value, if it was label, I'd say the label object dot text buttons it's dot text so this is a common sort of pattern you can use and I'm just going to pass in what you type into that text box as a parameter so I can do a file list on anything because that's really powerful right and now to run it I can just go here I think I've got everything and if I don't enter anything no problem it just does what it did but now if I were to say C colon backslash then it gives me what's in that drive or I have a, a D drive can also look there and it gives me what's available there so isn't that powerful aren't you riveted uh, but the point is that's how easy it is to configure this I'll do one more thing and I'll show you other ways to do some of these things uh, but what I want to do now is I want to add a close button to the form I can close the window like this but I feel like it's missing something without a button to close so I'm going to take now now realize I want to show you a little bit here there's list boxes there's text boxes as you've seen there's a lot of different things you can do tab control so if I wanted to make it a tab form <clears throat> and I have used this it works really easily you can do that it has a grid box it's a data grid box etc using a data grid is a little bit more involved so you do have to I'd say go look some blogs and things I find it challenging to do a data grid with like a SQL server result set <clears throat> and that's because internally it has to be converted to a data table so look at it it is great and it's very powerful that's a little more work but anyway back to our story here I'm gonna add a button and this button I'm just gonna change the text to be 
uh, close. Remember, that's the display value, not the name of the control. The name up here is, B, is button, but I want to change that to BTN. Okay. Now, not everything has default properties. The close button does have a default property, but if I want to, I can go anywhere in here to an event. Here I do need this, and I'm going to show you a bad practice, I'm going to say, because I'm going to create an event code for this that has nothing to do with the event. I'm going to call it uh, swell code, okay? And I just typed in swell code, and I hit enter. And fine. Now I'm creating a block of code called swell code, and I, it'll run whatever I want. Because it's tied to the property, it actually is wiring. The UI takes care of that. Designer is wiring and, set, and maps this event and object to this block of code. And in here, I can just say the name of my form. Again, the standard naming comes in handy form. I can just say form low main dot, and all I have to do is look for close. And there it is. Now, if I run this, I can say close, and it closes my window. But again, imagine you're looking through this. Let me try to... I got a phone call going. Okay, let me... Uh, So imagine you're going through this though, and you're trying to read this code, and you're seeing all of these uh, objects, but you can't tell what they are. I mean, you can see clearly that this button click event, you can see what's going on, right? You can see this button get file is click. But when you see swell code, you can't tell what that's doing, and you can't see the visual interface. Even if I go back to the designer, it's not clear what I'm referring to. That's close button. Um, I'd have to go back here, select the button, and then go to the events. And then I can say, oh, swell code. So that's a pretty weird way to, to write code. But if you want to write bad code, you're certainly welcome to do that. <laughs> but don't ask me to maintain it. Anyway, that's uh, the basic way you do things here. Now, this got me to the point I can test, I can work, you can debug, all that great stuff. But now we're at the riveting point in time where we want to compile our code and deploy it. So we go to deploy. And I'm going to say build. And you can say build and run, which will not only build it. Think of this as like compiling code in any, like C Sharp, or build and run. So I'm going to say build. And it gives you a lot of options of how you want to build it. But it's defaulting. I'm using version 5, and I want a Windows Form project. So that's what I'm going to use. But you can do, and again, I think this is really one of the cool features of PowerShell Studio. If I wanted to do a, a Windows service, which is kind of cool, I could write something as a service. If I want to have it as a Windows tray app, I could do that. Um, so it's got all these options. I'm going to go with what it's recommending and say OK. And notice it gives you messages in the tools output. It wrote my program as an exe file and a config file with it. If I go into the config file, notepad, you can see it's just an XML file basically with different properties. But of course, I could tweak these, etc. But the best thing is now I can just double click on my exe and, oops. We try something a little more interesting. Uh, get child item, it works. I really love that. Now you can do that. I've, there are utilities and things out there, but the integration is really nice. I love that it does that. I can now just hand someone an exe file and not have to give them PowerShell code and all these other pieces. Um, typically, I can take this and just zip it even to make it easier and smaller. Uh, but it's it's not that bad for size. I don't think of 400k trivial. All right, so good with that. And that gives us that. Now, if I did build and run, the only difference is at the end, it's going to say, I'm going to compile and run it. But notice it's also here ready to run. So it just runs it as well. The other thing I did want to show you is when I'm in here, I can't see the code for this form. And I might want to do that. So one way to get to the code is just say export to file. And it's going to say automatically your project name dot export dot PS1. It's not PowerShell, really, unless it's a PS1 file. So we want to get the actual code. OK, and then we see it here. Let me, if I can open this, uh, open. Let's see if I can open that, what it will do. I'm going to cancel that. I'm afraid it's going to run it, and I don't want to run it. Let me go back in. Oh, I, no, here it is. It did come up, <laughs> so I'm experimenting here. But what I want to show you is, let me close this for a minute. It's 
a little turkey grabbing this, but I want to show. So now what I have is the entire, in one file, I've got all the code related to this. And so it's extracted. And what happens too is things are hidden. These regions is part of PowerShell. It generates a lot of this. Um, what I really want to get to, oh, it's actually hiding a lot. Globals, here's the main form. So in this hidden region, you can see it's got all this main form stuff and all this stuff. So this is part of its wiring, its wiring events, command lines, things like that. Let me let me do this one way different. I'm going to say export again and I'll let it do that. Yes. This time I'll just open it with a notebook, notepad, because it makes it easier. One of the things you get are these these things for uh, data recovery. So I'd leave those alone because they tell you to. But notice you get comments, you get all this stuff. You get all kinds of stuff that's generated. So you only wrote a small bit, but notice all this stuff creating objects. And here's, here's a lot of stuff you wrote or this shells to functions you could run. You've got all this stuff happening, state values being created. At the bottom, you can see these are, this is for instance, creating the basic form. This is all the properties and things you need to create a button. So again, you could write all this if you want, right in PowerShell. You, there's nothing stopping you, but I'm really lazy. That, I mean, just to get a label, I have to give it all those properties. And if I type anything wrong, it's going to break. So not a fan of doing that from scratch, but you're welcome to if you're more less lazy than I am. I think I've covered everything here. Again, take a look at it. You do have source control integration, a lot of different tools. These are things that I have related to extra tools that... Sapien sold me somewhere. Uh, I don't know if I have all of them, but it integrates with those tools as well. All overall, it's it's got a lot of great features here and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I got to say I'm a fan. I suppose I'm not as uh, unbiased as I like to be, but I just like it. I think it's good. But I will give you the the rundown now as well. Uh, let me jump past this to get to the link. You can just go to PowerShell Studio on Sapien. And they have all this stuff here. They list their features and tell you all that great stuff. They don't generally quickly list the price. So I will tell you a little more. Let me see if I get that. There it is. All right. So what are the pros of using PowerShell Studio? Well, you have a lot of tools. You have the complete development for WinForms, which is great. But you also have things like for compiling, for optimization, for testing, for performance, uh, for encryption etc there's a lot of different tools and it's all integrated and it comes up quickly so it is meant to be it's meant to be an all-encompassing powershell world it includes the consoles etc and it you don't need any other powershell development tool when you have it i already said that and these are features it offers like the the powershell editor gui tools you saw it does support a really nice intellisense scripts to MSI installers, advanced functions, all this kind of stuff. And one thing I didn't get into a lot, but I want to play with personally, is a lot of those templates, because it said, do you want to do, you know, this type of form or that type of project? And it will generate a lot of the code for you, so you don't have to do as much work. So I want to play with that as well. But personally, it's just cool. I, I bought it. I can't justify it. I have a crappy car. <laughs> Not a crappy car, an older car. I don't care about cars, but I love technology, so I just bought it because it was cool. And I do use it, though. I have used it professionally on a number of occasions. The cons. Really, the thing that it comes down to is cost, right? I mean, SQL Server is awesome, but I don't. I can't afford to pay for SQL Server Enterprise Edition myself. And this is a lot cheaper than that, though. It's uh, 399 is what I think I last saw as the cost, initial cost for buying this. And 399.99, I think it was. Take a look. Uh, and then you also have to think about, well, do you want to keep maintaining it? You can keep that and, main, and get the updates for a year and then just stick with it and not update it. Uh, but if you're in an ongoing kind of maintenance environment, you tend to like to get the latest features, bug, bug fixes or enhancements, whatever. So you may want to pay the maintenance, which is typically, I, I want to say, I don't, I'm not as, I don't sell it, so, but I think it's about half the price to maintain it. If it's a couple of people, that's not, it's really cheap. If you have a lot of people, I would suggest, having been in sales myself at Microsoft, reach out to Sapien and talk to them. Maybe you can negotiate a discount. The longer term cost is going to be the maintenance anyway. 
So most companies focus on that initial cost, but I would focus on getting a good deal on maintenance. But see what you can do. If you have like a thousand people are going to use this, I'm pretty sure they'd be willing to talk to you and, and find a way to arrange something there. The big question you have to ask yourself if you're going to buy it, though, is will you use the features? I bought it for the coolness, and I didn't know if I would really use it or not for the GUI development. But as I got into more and more projects as a consultant, I found the need for it, particularly for the GUI, was was the reason I needed to use it. But then I found that the other feature I really liked was the way it just automatically click and you get an EXC. So I like those features. There's other things in there though. Now I'm kind of uh, doing this presentation has piqued my interest in. Now, anytime you get an advanced tool in development, you know that means more complexity. There's more options, there's more bells, there's more whistles, and that's fun. You're like, a, you know, I always talk about it's like a kid on uh, a holiday or Christmas morning or something or birthday where they open all the presents and they never say oh my god too many presents too many bells and you can hand you know the most complicated computer equipment or a phone to a kid in five minutes they figure it out that this is great but as adults we tend to be a little more skittish when you use something like PowerShell Studio there's a lot of options a lot of features uh, you don't have to use them but you do have to kind of understand how to navigate the environment so it's more work to understand and use than just using the PowerShell IDE but again the biggest thing is, do you get the value, the bang of the buck? If you are a, a PowerShell developer, you do a lot of work either as a consultant or a, your company has a lot of administrative work and etc. You should definitely at least look at it. It's uh, worth considering. There are a lot of PowerShell MVPs. At least last I checked, several PowerShell MVPs work for Sapien Technologies. They do a lot of blogging and things like that and speaking around the subject. So anyway, that's that's my point on that. So let's review what we've talked about. We talked about WinForms versus WPF versus UWP. And at the end of the day, like just a couple of years ago, I've been, oh my God, you got to change things. You're good with WinForms. Don't worry about it. That's my advice. Don't worry about it. You're good with WinForms. PowerShell 6, 5, 6, and 7, we talked about the sole searching event in our life that we have to decide, are we ready to move to PowerShell Core? I'm still searching for that decision. I, I probably am one of the few people that really still likes to use the PowerShell ISC, and that holds me back a bit, and the PowerShell modules. But I also just don't use Linux much. Maybe one of my contracts or consultant will come up where suddenly I need it, and then my song will change. But that's where I'm at now. And as far as Windows GUI development, we talked a lot about that. You've got you know objects, a whole set of objects in a hierarchy, and events we click code to. And we saw that with PowerShell Studio, you know, we can do all kinds of stuff there. We looked at options, right? We talked about what options do we have if we want to do a GUI development. We can do a certain amount just using show form and outgrid view and just built in PowerShell stuff. We can extend it as much as we want. One thing I didn't mention too is there are a lot of built in windows, what they call common dialogues, like uh, opening a file, color picker, etc. And it's really easy. I Somewhere I have a talk on that as well. You can use those also in your apps without having to get a full Windows development. Little function call, boom, it'll call it. So it's really easy. But if you really want to get a full kind of PowerShell high-end solution, I think PowerShell Studio is the most extensive platform I've seen for just developing and writing PowerShell code and especially for writing WinForm applications. So I want to thank you for watching this. I hope you liked it. Normally my content is on github.com slash bcafficky slash shared. I don't really have any content I think is necessary to share here. The app I wrote, you saw it. It was really easy. I would suggest follow along with what I'm doing and write it yourself. It's, it's trivial. So I'm not going to put it out there unless somebody really thinks there's value to that. I... If you want more videos that talk about developing Windows applications or things in PowerShell, let me know in the comments what things you would look at. I don't try to get into, you know, writing net BIOS interrupt calls and assembler with PowerShell. I think there are levels where it gets a little too hairy to, to do a video on, but I'm certainly uh, glad to talk about it. I think I will do one on 567 because I need to look at that closer. Please subscribe, share, let people know, and thank you for watching.